Despite being a man of God, he uh, we'll more. very more. much a two-time in environment, and moved frequently in the dead of night to keep collectors off his head. His brother caught wind of this and wrote him a letter, basically saying, Hey, uh, maybe you should pay your bills now and then so you can be, you know, a functioning member of society. To which Charles replied, and I quote, Find seven dollars in clothes, stick it up your bunghole, and wipe your nose on it, and that will remind you of the estimation in which you are held by Charles J. Guiteau. God damn. And to his own brother the madman. Soon after he got arrested, bailed out by his sister, lived with her for a few months, attacked her with an axe, yeah, went to DC, rambled about religion to anyone who would listen, moved to Boston, got in a boat accident where everyone in his boat was fine, but everyone in the other one fucking died, took this as a sign from God, moved back to New York, and got back into politics in 1880, this time as a Republican. During this campaign, there were two main factions of Republicans, known as the Stalwarts and the Half-Breeds, which sounds Gotta like go. Shit, which All right, we bro, names like that today. Now, Guiteau considered himself a stalwart, and in a similar vein to his 1872 We'll try to make this one count, but, uh... Wrote, stalwart candidate Ulysses S. Grant, who was shooting well, for his third say. term. But before he got a chance to deliver the speech, I'll probably have just enough time to finish it. took the candidacy completely Seamless. out of nowhere, beating out both factions single-handedly. He was like, rats, how am I gonna get power handed to me now? So he literally just scribbled out all the references to Grant that and was replaced actually fast. with Garfield, and was like, yep, that'll do. You're here? Yeah, I know you're here, bro. Handing out copies to the Republican National Committee. In reality, this really didn't accomplish much, but when Garfield managed to win the election, he told us like, Yes! That was entirely me. Garfield is in my supreme debt. As God is my witness, he shall make me a consulate in Vienna or Paris or someplace cool like that. He went to DC to await his inevitable Coffee. appointment, but obviously nothing happened. So he started writing letters. A lot of letters. When that didn't work, he started actually stalking both. Both Garfield and the Secretary of State, James Blaine, intercepting them in hotel lobbies, just being like, oh, hey, yeah, it's me, the sole person responsible for your success. Say, how about a consulship? <laughs> All right, you'll get back to me, I get it. Whoa, <laughs> what a coincidence. Me again. How's that consulship coming? At first, they simply ignored him, but eventually Blaine snapped, screaming, never speak to me again on the Paris consulship as long as you live. <laughs> Damn you, Garfield! I sense a disturbance in the force. Maybe daylight savings just made Monday an hour longer. Wow, Garfield, that was quite the wisecrack. It's oh God, that's cursed. To keep things fresh year after year. Burn in hell, beige dog. At this point, Guito completely renounced any faith in the current administration, and after a lifetime of clout chasing met only with disappointment, he decided his only option was straight up going postal. He convinced himself that it was now God's will to remove Garfield from this mortal plane in order to put his stalwart vice president, Chester Allen Arthur, into power. When he went to buy a revolver, he was given the choice between a wood grip and an ivory grip. He went with the ivory one for no other reason then he thought it would look cooler in a museum and on july 2nd 1881 he ambushed garfield at the baltimore and potomac railroad station shooting him twice in the back and mortally wounding him all because he wouldn't give him a job. Garfield managed to hang on for 11 weeks before finally dying, which sounds like hell. Today's modern physicians actually believe that Garfield could have easily survived the incident if it weren't for doctors digging through him with unsanitized tools. Hey, modern medicine, thanks for not being worse than literally no medicine. It means a lot. But that didn't stop Guiteau from being formally charged with murder. And that's exactly what he wanted. Matter of fact, Guiteau was over the moon, taking his new nationwide infamy as the fame he always deserved. His trial was just bananas, with Guiteau hurling obscenities at just about everyone there, including his own defense team, and formatting his testimony as an epic poem which he recited in full. He even dictated an autobiography to the New York Herald, which, get this, he ended with a personal ad for a nice Christian lady under 30 years of age. What a baller. When the guilty verdict was read, he called everybody there low consummate jackasses, and on June 30th, 1882, Guiteau smiled and waved to his adoring fans as he was walked to the gallows where he recited a repetitive, deranged poem he wrote that morning, which was performed in a high-tech falsetto voice, since it was written in the point of view of a child. He asked for a full orchestra to play during the reading, but I don't have to tell you that one, no worries. And promptly thereafter, he was home. When the gallows dropped, people were probably like, oh, Jesus, it's finally over. I just came in for a nice little execution. They subject me to all that. Oh, my money back, frankly. So it just goes to show, you can't always get what you want. Unless that thing is getting everyone to hate you, that's extraordinarily easy. But 
for everything else. This run will die. Combination of hard work and no. And it wasn't well, like. Former must ultimately come from within. Um, There's plenty of Curse the runner with it. I remember. The best of which is a seldom talked about little startup called Skillshare. Sponsor time. Okay, Skillshare buddy. is an online learning community with over twenty-five thousand classes in design, business, technology, Stand and more. Still. Premium membership gives you unlimited access to high-quality classes on must-know topics, so you can improve your skills, unlock new opportunities, and do the work you love. A wise philosophy. This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Gaming. Hey kids, time to alienate 23.9% of the United States from my potential audience, because today we're talking popes. Now don't get me wrong, the modern papacy is a great thing. Just a genuinely virtuous man being elected to govern and set an example for Christians everywhere. That's awesome. But back in the day, not so. See, in the Middle Ages, the church was one of the greatest powers in the Western world, having massive influence over monarchs and laymen alike. And as we know, with great power, comes great tomfoolery. Here's some of the less wholesome popes that history has to offer. Pope Stephen VI assumed the pontificate in May of 896, during a time of great instability for the papacy, where rulers and families of all different shapes and sizes were vying for influence over the Catholic Church. As such, successive popes from this period often had different ideas about how things should be run. Stephen, for example, didn't much care for Pope Formosus, the guy before last. Why? Uh, it's complicated. Even if I could wrap my head around all this, it'd probably be boring as hell. So just take it on good faith that Steve had a lot of beef with Formosus. So much beef, or as we call it, Papal Bull, that Stephen couldn't even be happy that the dude was already dead. So he had the eight-month-old corpse of Formosus dug up, dressed up in Pope clothes, sat down on a throne, and literally put on trial, with a deacon appointed to give all his responses for him. So you thought you could get away from the law with that little dying stunt of yours. Well, tell me, Mr. Thrombosis, did you violate canon law, commit perjury, and pretend to be a bishop when you weren't? Yes, pasta fazool, I am a fool. I've heard all I need to hear. This court finds you guilty, and everything you did as Pope, we legally declare to be fake and dumb and stupid and dumb. Now throw him in the river. What? The river? Can, can he do that? See the hat? That means I'm Pope. P-O-O-P -O -O -P, Pope. You better three-point that bitch into the briny deep right quick, or I'm gonna raise hell metaphorically, so they throw him in the river. This whole thing caused an uproar among Formosus supporters, and after Formosus' corpse was allegedly seen performing miracles at the riverbank, Stephen ended up being overthrown, imprisoned, and executed by strangulation. <laughs> the body, now slimy and disgusting, was fished out of the Tiber and reinterred in St. Peter's Basilica, oh my God. where it rests to this day. Next, we'll talk about John the Twelfth. This so guy is this already like one of my characters. Why don't we just, uh, yeah, there we go. This guy ascended to the throne when he was just 18 years old, which is insane. If I was elected world's biggest hat wearer at that age, you better believe things would get real unpayful real quick. I'm talking gambling, hookers, setting fires, and toasting to the devil. And when you know it, these are all things John XII did. It's said that he took the sacred palace and literally made it into a whorehouse. Matter of fact, while researching the guy, I stumbled across this list of sexually active popes. This is a real <laughs> Wikipedia article. Take a hike, toilet paper orientation, daddy's got a new favorite. John is featured prominently on this list, of course. He had a thing for widows for some reason. Personally, I'm not big on weepy old hags. I'm more of a carefree young hag type of guy, but to each their own. He also banged his niece a bunch, which not the most virtuous act, but you know, the middle ages and bloodline fighting, whatever. His playboy lifestyle eventually caught up to him though, leading to the Synod of Rome, where everyone got together to talk about what a piece of shit he is so they could kick him off the throne. Besides all the deviancy, there was a lot of things they had problems with. For one, someone once offered John some money to ordain a 10 year old as a bishop, and he was just like, all right, I would have done it for free, honestly. Look how big those robes are on him, that's hilarious. He also had a deacon ordained in a horse stable, What's just like, oh, for fuck's sake, all right, let's get this over with. Uh, shouldn't we be doing this in like, a church? Listen, bucko, if it's good enough for Jesus to be born in, it's good enough for you to have your little cardinal party. No, sir, not cardinal, he's just a deacon. Now if you keep running your mouth yarn. He also liked going on hunting trips now and then, generally considered to be something popes don't do. Although my suspicion is that they were just tired of cleaning his big stupid camo hat every time. Probably his worst act, though, was putting on a helmet, followed closely in second by the time one of his subdeacons got on his nerves, so he literally cut off his dick and murdered him. So between all this and some 
conflicts with Otto I of the Holy Roman Empire, Whatever, dude. John was uncanonically ousted in 963. Except, as soon as Otto left Rome, nobody was there to pressure him off physically anymore. So John was like, lol, just kidding, rounded up all his groupies, kicked the new pope off the throne, and continued his role like nothing happened by early 964. But just a few months later, fate caught up with John, and he died the way he lived committing adultery. Now let's be real, we all have our little guilty pleasures in life. Some people like a nice bag of Cheetos, others like scented candles, or poorly drawn educational videos. Alexander VI like watching horses fuck. According to Vatican chronicler Johann Burkhardt, he would specifically arrange for his stallions to be introduced to mares in heat outside his palace, and he'd stand up on his balcony to watch him violently mate, which just tickled him pink for some fucking reason, and he'd laugh uproariously during the entire spectacle. He also once threw a party in the palace called the Banquet of Chestnuts, also referred to as the Joust of Whores. Wait a minute, horse jousting, horses banging. Was dyslexia a thing back then? Nah, but during the banquet, Alexander and 50 of Rome's finest raggedy harlots line up and strip down for him and his guests, which, by the way, included two of his children, which, by the way, he had many children, <laughs> oh my but at this God. point hardly a concern. Guests began throwing chestnuts at the ladies, who got down on their hands and knees and scrambled frantically like the cook at Denny's when I held him at gunpoint, trying to collect as many as they could. After this went on for a while, Alexander was like, alright kiddos, game time. Whoever can nice. finish the most bras before the night's over wins Rome's finest silks. The only condition is that anyone who makes what a saving pace gamer did. Is disqualified. It's too easy. This is all according to that one Johan guy, mind you. Some secondary sources differ pretty significantly on the more lurid details of all this, so do take it with a grain of salt. But at the same time, this guy was the official record taker for the ceremonies he was involved with, so it seems equally likely to me that the other guys just wanted to save a bit of face, but who knows. In the end, primary sources are usually the most reputable source of information. After all, what better way to learn about stuff than from people who have direct experience in the subject? That's why you need to try Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with over we'll share again for more videos now thanks to Dashlane nice. for sponsoring this video Hey kids, whether no, you're fine, a precocious okay. young lad down by the swimming hole or a grizzled crime scene investigator, everybody's got some interest in dead bodies. Yes, from Weekend at Bernie's to Weekend at Bernie's 2 to Weekend at Bernie's 3 revelations, stories about wayward corpses have certainly carved their niche in today's media. So, I thought I'd spin a few yarns about some real life people who were kept out far past their expiration date. Our first tale follows one Elmer McCurdy, who was an outlaw during the twilight days of the Wild West. Thanks to his former life as a miner, McCurdy acted as the demolitions expert to his little posse, using nitroglycerin basically any time he had the faintest excuse to do so. Except, he was kind of a moron, so it didn't usually go quite as planned. Gotta say, after peanut butter and chocolate, my favorite combination of two things is probably gross incompetence and high explosives. Example, in March of 1911, McCurdy's band of rabble-rousers found out that $4,000 were in a safe in an approaching train. They managed to stop the entire locomotive, I don't even know how you do that, break in, hold everyone on board hostage, and locate the safe. McCurdy steps up the plate, right? Gotta blast the thing open, except I guess the excitement kinda got to him, cause he ended up using like way too much nitroglycerin, like inordinate amounts. Ended up completely destroying the safe and its contents, and what few silver coins they made out with were literally melted to the frame of the safe and had to be peeled off. Anyway, he died in a shootout with police later that year, and the undertaker at the funeral home he was sent to couldn't find any next of kin on account of McCurdy being a rambling low live varmint. So he just embalmed the hell out of him and said, Hey boys and girls, want to see a dead criminal? Only one shiny nickel. And since Live Leak wasn't around at the time, there weren't many places a kid could go to stare at a corpse for a while if you were so designed. So it actually became a pretty popular attraction. Visitors would pay their dues by physically slipping the coin into the man's mouth, and the creepy ass undertaker would come fish him out later, probably with bare hands all slowly and sensual like. A few years passed when a couple of guys showed up claiming to be McCurdy's brothers with a note from the local sheriff to back it up. They told the undertaker they had permission to go bury McCurdy, 
so he reluctantly relinquished the body to the men. Except, these guys weren't his brothers. They were just a couple of crusty freaking carnies. They shipped the body off to Kansas <gasps> to become an attraction in Jesus. a traveling show. From here, McCurdy traded hands a few the more times. Twisted. At one point, he was exploited for this one guy's film about narcotics. He was like, yeah, this pill-popping degenerate got shot while trying to rob a pharmacy for more dope the other day. The body was super old by then, so people were like, wait, why is he all desiccated and flaky and gross? He just goes, yep, yeah, that's what happens when you do drugs, kids. Your fucking skin falls off. Stay above the influence. At some point in his journey, he ended up getting coated in wax and paint to look a little less rotty, before ending up in a warehouse in 1949. Here's the thing, he was in there alongside some actual wax figures, and after spending 19 years in storage, nobody knew he was a real corpse anymore. So he ended up getting sold in 1968 as a mannequin to one Spoony Singh, owner of the Hollywood Wax Museum. He tried to lend the guy out a couple times during his stay, but people found him too gross or unrealistic looking for whatever purposes they had in mind. So he ended up getting sold again and used as a prop of a hanged man at the Pike Amusement Zone in their fun house ride, with zero knowledge that he was an actual dead criminal. It wasn't until 1976, 65 years after his death, that an episode of The Six Million Dollar Man was being filmed at the complex, and a stagehand tried to move the prop around, only to have its arm break off in his hand. He was like, ugh, lousy stiff. Wait a minute, that's curious. This mannequin's got human flesh and bones inside of it. Wait a minute. Uh-oh. 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 The autopsy confirmed what everyone uh -oh. present at the time uh -oh. suspected. Uh -oh. By this point, the body was so dried out and stale that it only weighed 50 pounds. Which makes me think, we should start a radical new fad diet where we just get people to mummify parts of their body. Like, Jenny, guess what? I just lost 30 pounds in 5 days. Wow, holy heck, how'd you do that? They call it the Egyptian cleanse. Anyway, with that, McCurdy was finally laid to rest back in his homeland of Oklahoma, and that film crew's lives were never the same again. Flashback to late 18th century. Baloney. There lived a physician by the name of Luigi Galvani. This guy was a big deal. He's the dude who discovered that, hey, animals got electricity in them. And his legacy still survives today in words that was like weird. galvanize. One of his most famous experiments was the one where he used static electricity to make frog legs twitch on command. Around these parts, we call that the French salute. Ha <laughs> ha. Stereo. Life's funny. Well, in 1803, his nephew, Giovanni Aldini, said, Hey, that's pretty nifty and all, but uh, what if we tried it on people? So the city of London was like, hey, now you're thinking with portals. One freshly executed criminal coming up. Aldini gathered a crowd and applied two diodes to the corpse's head, causing his face to scrunch up and one eye to flick open. Aldini was a showman, though. He wanted some real action. So he then put the current through opposite points in the body, which made the whole thing flail around like Pinocchio in heat. Now, today we know he was just exciting the dead muscles, right? But the people who were watching had no idea what was going on. So they were like, Jesus Christ, this guy's a fucking necro. Romancer. Quick, look at grandma, maybe we can get in the will after all. Fun fact, this experiment actually ended up serving as inspiration for Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which makes me wonder what other famous novels were based on real life events. Was a white whale ever pursued by a vengeful sea captain? Was there actually a mentally handicapped migrant worker who liked hugging rabbits to death? Was there ever a human soul as profoundly asinine and willfully ignorant as Amelia Bedelia? God, I hate her glassy-eyed face so fucking much. I just want to mash it into a running waffle maker and be like, ha, huh, isn't that ironic? Grab her by her vacant fucking head, throw her out of a 747 and say, Hey, why didn't you shoot yourself when you had the chance? Get it! Anyway, one thing we learned today is the importance of reputability. And just as you wouldn't want some dirty <gasps> Sponsor, sponsor, sponsor. Sponsor. Crazy, you certainly wouldn't want the same fate to befall your valuable online information. That's why you need to try Dashlane. Dashlane's been all over the place recently, and with good reason. In this day and age... Perfect. More dead body hijinks? Hey kids, time to talk about more cases of stiff lifting from the days of yore. If you haven't seen part one yet, go check it out. Or don't. I'm a YouTuber, not a cop, unfortunately. This first tale doesn't feature an entire dead body, but I still found it interesting enough to talk about. So one day in 2012, a priest was riding a train out of Italy when his bag got stolen by a trio of thieves. Inside the bag was whatever normal personal possessions the guy happened to own, as well as a small vial containing the blood of none other than Pope John Paul II. So this begs the question. 
question. Why did the priest have Pope blood in his bag? Well, an important way that the Catholic Church honors saints and other venerated individuals is the keeping of relics. These relics are ranked in terms of how close they were to the person at hand. You got something that's tangentially related to a saint in any way? That's a third class relic. If it's a personal possession of a saint, it's second class. And as for first class relics, those typically consist of literal body parts and or fluids of a holy figure. Now for you youngsters out there, in 1981, the Pope got shot four times by some fascist having a bad day. People are like, holy shit, it's a pope aside. Is that even a word? No, no, I'm okay. Oh. Say, who left all this first class relic lying around? So to this day, there remain three objects containing the fine aged popey juice spilled that fateful afternoon. That's the vial okay. was found a few hours later by police among the reeds and grass near the station, which basically means the thieves took one look at it and were like, blood? I already make this myself. Lame. And tossed it out <laughs> without a second thought. Here's the thing though, that's not the only instance of old JP2 getting blood napped. In 2014, a similar yeah, relic was yoinked from the church of San Pietro della Yenca in Italy alongside a crucifix. The fact that these were the only items taken led to two prevailing theories. Some people thought that, since John Paul II wasn't technically a saint yet, the relic's value would go way up once the man was actually canonized, so the thieves decided to take it now and resell it later. The other theory was way more popular with the media. After all, what use does Pope blood have other than satanic rituals? This story naturally got a lot of press, and the whole world just kind of assumed that Lucifer himself was set to return any day now. Eventually, the thieves confessed, so authorities came to the rehab facility they were staying at. They returned the cross, but when questioned about Four the relic, seconds, they were like, wait, what? Pope blood? Satan? Do you guys need to check in here too? Eventually, it was found in a rubbish bin on the facility grounds, which means once again, it was just casually tossed out as nonsense. Do you ever throw out Pope blood? Because apparently, multiple people have done that on separate occasions just in the past seven years. It doesn't end there, of course. In 2016, this happened a third time when a piece of cloth with John Paul fluid on it was taken from Cologne Cathedral. I can't for the life of me find a follow-up to this story, which leads me to believe that they are just like, fuck it, Pope blood's more trouble than it's worth at this point. But if you guys could find some conclusion to where it ended up, let me know below. Now, our next story begins with a man named Carl Tanzler, a German-born radiology technologist in early 20th century Florida. He looked kind of like Sigmund Freud. Florida, bro. Looking. On the inside, he was a pretty normal dude, other than the fact that he claimed to have visions throughout his life of some mysterious dark-haired girl. Anyway, in 1930, while working at the Marine Hospital in Key West, he met a young woman by the name of Maria Elena Florida represent, bro. called Elena for short, and he said, oh my god, that's a girl from the visions I've been having. Yeah, she. Wait, what? We were meant to be today. We must be soulmates. What? Don't you have like a wife and two kids? Destiny. Boyos was soon diagnosed with tuberculosis, which was considered fatal at the time. So naturally, Carl decided to handle her. That hit. Going as no way. That was so lucky. To let him visit their home every day. Except he was a radiologist, so even if there were reliable means to treat tuberculosis no at the time, yeah. he definitely didn't have the credentials to do so. But whatever. This is the past we're talking about. After all, that place was a shit show from start to finish. I'm not about to get on somebody's case for a little clerical yes. error. In addition to whatever salvage, it's coming to the point where this is actually unironically harder than my football team. Tanzler showered her with gifts of clothes and jewelry. I know he meant well, it's actually unironically harder. Illness. I just be insulted for like, some wow, godforsaken reason. This, reason. Out on the this town. quick kill anyway, is literally harder than my quick kill. For some reason, it's just harder. I miss it way more. in love with you. <laughs> oh my god. I'm so glad you feel the same. Boyos inevitably succumbed to the disease, leaving Tanzler heartbroken. He just wasn't ready to part ways with his pestilence riddled sweetheart. So he asked the family's permission to commission an above ground mausoleum for their daughter. And since this was the early 20th century, they said, ah, What a sweet, selfless man. I'm sure he'd never do this just so he could commit crimes against nature. Then he was like, Oh yeah, by the way, could I have some of her hair too? Sure, kind stranger. Here's a bag of her hair we just had lying around for some fucking reason. Bro, Again, kind stranger. No red flags here. This he went to visit of her kind stranger. every night for two years. Then finally one day he said, You know what, kid? You're alright. Say, how's about we dish this musty old mausoleum and go back to my place? I'll take that as a yes. 
So we took her home in a little red toy wagon, which is ridiculous. It makes me picture him skipping around, whistling the merry tune. Hey, neighbor. Now here's a riddle for all you intellectuals out there. What do a dead body and a used PT Cruiser have in common? Sure, they both taste terrible, and you never want to be seen in public with one. Most importantly, though, they're a depreciating asset. But hey, that didn't stop old Gnarly Carly from sprucing her up any way he could, wiring her bones back together with coat hangers, Brr. replacing her skin with wax and silk, making a wig out of that bag of hair from earlier, and soaking the body in massive amounts of perfume and disinfectants, for obvious reasons. He claimed to have been instructed to do all this by Elena's spirit, which he would apparently talk to frequently. He also did, you know, that thing eccentric loners do with dead ladies in their house. We won't talk about that. This went on for seven years, seven hot and humid Florida years, until 1940 when Elena's sister saw him dancing with some lady through the curtains. She's like, aw, how cute. I'm glad that old bag of lentils has finally found one. Walks in, comes to find out it's her fucking dead sister. So the cops come, but there isn't any conclusive evidence of any flirting and philandering with the body. So the only crime Carl could have been charged with was grave robbing, except the statute of limitations was already up by the time he was found out. So they just took the body, tipped their hats, and went on their merry way. Chancellor still missed Elena dearly, but since he couldn't have her cadaver, he crafted a crude homemade effigy of the lady, which he lived with for the rest of his life. Here's the part that really gets me, though. He apparently went back to live with his estranged wife once the jig was up. Just like, hey babe, I know we haven't talked since the whole corpse thing, but uh, I've been having trouble making rent. Do you think I can come crash for a while? Sure, come right in. I'll take your coats. Would you and the demented life-size replica of your long-dead lover that you left me for like a cup of tea? I'd like one. None for her, though. It goes right through her. <laughs> Of course, I'm making all this out to be a horrifying thing for the goofs and gaffs of it. But at the time, a lot of people read the news stories about Tansler, and many actually sympathized that, with Arnie? the man. They saw him as the distraught, hapless <sighs> that he saw himself as. You know why they had that compassion? Because they listened. Say, what would the world look like if we all listened more? Sponsor time. Listening to audiobooks inspires us, motivates us, even brings us closer. And there's Wait, no better place Ace is to like a 1x. I don't audio. even know if I can beat what that. What should you listen to, you have? I was just doing work on these sponsors, dude. Hey kids, if you've ever been Black Friday shopping or visited the Diablo subreddit recently, chances are you've encountered mass hysteria at some point. Mass hysteria is known medically as mass psychogenic illness, or MPI for short. It's basically just when a bunch of people start acting a fool for no discernible reason other than maybe a stressful environment. Being that this sort of thing is naturally very noticeable, there's loads of documented cases found all throughout history. Let's take a look at a few. This first one is what made me make this video in the first place. So one day sometime in in the Middle Ages, a group of nuns in a French convent were enjoying a quiet, uneventful day until one of them decided to start meowing. You know, like a cat. You'd think this would last all of four seconds before another nun was like, Excuse me, Sister Gertrude, would you kindly cut the shit? But instead, another nun joined in, and another, until basically the entire nunnery was exchanging mouths like a group of communist trading card enthusiasts. This wasn't just a one-time thing either. It basically Wait, mouths? Okay, that's well. funny, dude. It said that I get that day, reference, guys. I get the Epic Gamer reference. Oh my god, hours dude. At a time. Could you imagine being the first outsider to witness this? You might laugh now, but as they say, Everybody gangsta till the nuns start now. <laughs> I'd void my bowels and move to Malaysia without even thinking. Miles more terrifying than this pile of garbage. As you can imagine though, after a while it stopped being scary and just got annoying, leading to the neighbors calling in a band of soldiers to deal with the situation. Hey guys, can we talk to you for a sec about uh... Yeah, yeah that. Uh, all due respect, but we have orders to literally beat the hell out of you with whips till you start acting like people again. Sorry sir, it's just... Force of habit. Haha, <laughs> habit. Seriously though, we would rather go to hell for throttling a gaggle of nuns than put up with another minute of your bullshit, crazy. Our next event took place in the parish of Fatima, Portugal in the year 1917. It all started with three shepherd children, ages 10, 9, and 7 respectively. They were like, greetings fellow Portugueseites. Uh, we've been seeing visions of the Virgin Mary, and she told us to tell you that some real crazy shit's gonna go down in the sky on October 13th. Now, if three random farm children started spouting out prophecies to the public today, you'd say, ha, huh, what tomfoolery. Go play in some dirt, you dirty little dirt baby. But keep in mind, the past is a different country. 
and Portugal's a different country. <laughs> so that's like different country squared you gotta think about. Plus this was during World War One, a time where a lot of people were holding out for a miracle to begin with. So the kid's story was actually picked up and even spread by local newspapers to the point where when the day finally You're came, at least 30,000 people on Slapsy. gathered in Fatima to witness the alleged miracle. Lo and behold, on that day, the sun began zooming around, careening towards Earth and sending rays of multicolored light cascading across the sky, creating a light show like nobody's ever seen. Keep in mind, this happened in the 20th century, way after the era where belief in divine jiggery and or pokery was considered mandatory. So naturally, there were plenty of skeptics and non-believers present, and even they saw it all happen. Or so they thought. How do we know the sun didn't really whiz around haphazardly that day? Hmm? Well, number one, use your freaking brain. And number two, accounts differed wildly from person to person. While some say the sun zigged hither, others say it zagged thither, and others still said it shined a brilliant yellow and stayed perfectly still. As such, it was eventually concluded that the event was just a combination of MPI and oh, bro. stuff with too much sun staring. Although I'd like to believe it was real, just that Jesus' illusion skill was way higher than his alteration at the time. Yep, that's it. Sam's going to hell. Why, for blasphemy? Trust me, that was the least offensive part of that joke. Our next tale took place in 1962 in Tanganyika, which was basically just the beta version of Tanzania. Okay. The nation had just declared its independence from Britain the previous year, and with the future so uncertain, tensions were naturally running high around this time. One little girl in a Tanganyikan school ended up handling the stress in a bit of an unusual way. Rather than overeating or staring at her ceiling for hours like a normal person, she just started laughing and laughing and laughing. Pretty soon, her classmates at the all kind of laughing school she attended began to join in, to the point where 95 of the 159 students caught the gigglies, which lasted anywhere from a few hours to 16 days straight. Beyond just the unprovoked cackling, other odd behavior included aimless running and occasional violence. The problem got so severe that the school was forced to close down temporarily, <sighs> leading to the chortlers roaming the streets, spreading the affliction further. Thousands of people from all strata came to be affected, with 13 additional schools being shut down in the process. Over the course of the hysteria, several other symptoms began to present themselves as well, ranging from obvious ones such as breathing problems, fainting, random screaming, to more anomalous things like rashes. Despite all this, no physical cause could be found, leaving MPI as the only explanation. The epidemic finally died down after between 6 and 18 months of day in, day out laughing, depending on the village. While this whole thing likely sucked for most people involved, it probably We are gaming right now. A lot of the time when I'm alone, I'll think to myself, man, if I ever go full skits, so I hope I'm one of the laughy ones, not one of the screamy ones. With this story in mind, just maybe, if I put my mind to it and believe hard enough, I can be both. Flashback to the year 1518 to the city of Strasbourg. Can I make some other counts? What do you mean by that? Mrs. Trophy began fervently dancing <sighs> in the streets for no discernible reason, for hours, then days. All without music, of course. Her only breaks consisted of occasional food intake and passing out from exhaustion when night came. If you saw that, ah, uh, okay, that throws. makes sense. But apparently, people found it pretty inspiring because within a week, 34 others had joined in, and after a month, there were around 400. This wasn't your casual bobbing up and down neither. This shit made Zumba look like Tai Chi. Here's the best modern day right, simulation. Crafting dollar, crafting dollar. I remember. I'm gonna remember. I'm gonna remember. I'm crafting dweller, crafting dweller, crafting dweller, crafting the dweller, crafting the dweller hat, I'm crafting the dweller hat. people were the same person, and you got crafting the dweller hat, I'm this crafting the dweller hat. This healthy person, let alone a medieval city dweller, but nice. despite... Okay, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. They just kept going. In fact, they went so hard for so long that a good portion straight up fucking died from cardiac arrest. It got to the point where around 15 dancers were kicking the bucket every day before the city decided they had to do something about it. They managed to rule out any divine or super natural causes, which was necessary just because, you know, back in the medieval times, you know, fucking stupid. They eventually surmised that it was a natural disease caused by too much hot blood cool. as per that whole cool. four humans thing that was popular. It's cool, it's cool, it's cool. As for a cure, cool. their prescription cool. was, get this, more dancing. I can see where they were coming from. It's pretty sound logic. If you got a song stuck in your head, you play it till you're sick of it. Same kind of thing. But here's where they goofed. The authorities actually went out of their way to facilitate the dancing, setting up a big stage area and even hiring musicians to keep the afflicted moving. All this achieved was attracting more passerby. Yeah, my mom's gonna come home soon. I'm gonna have to explain to her why I'm on the computer at 9 o'clock. Let's get in on that. Causing the contagion to be I'm in the middle of a hat run, mom. Seeing that there's solution no one understands. The city then went the other way and completely banned any public dancing. Those who still showed signs of the mania were subsequently carted off to the shrine of St. Vitus, where an exorcism-like ritual 
ritual was performed on them. This ended up being highly effective, presumably for no other reason than that the dancers believed Or I can just have credit, credits warp right, right now and then get well, more record. Happy Boggy. Well, most likely a case of good old-fashioned MPI. Some historians believe it might have been egged on in part Yeah, by bro, my mom is a boomer. If she, gets me, if she makes me get off at MU5, I'm gonna... I'm gonna leave home. I'm just gonna quit life. I might as well give a shout out to another as well. Today's video is sponsored by Chet, a network focused on producing fascinating content covering topics like technology, products, businesses, and the like through the lens of innovation. Here's one about I got that game paths, or something. You know, like those lines of dead grass from people taking more convenient. Uh. Hey kids, I think we can all agree that there are few pastimes more grotesque than competitive eating. The concept of a bunch of guys pushing their anatomy to its limits just for sport leaves a bad taste in my mouth in more ways than one. But imagine if these men didn't adopt this habit just for fun. Imagine if some gross biological error forced them to eat like this for their entire life. Introducing Tarare. Tarare was born in France around 1772 to a poor farming family. It's said that his appetite was so voracious that, by his teens, Tarare could eat an entire quarter of a cow carcass in a single day. You'd think he'd be like mega obese, but no, he only weighed 100 pounds by age 17. However, there were still a few things that stood out about Tarare appearance-wise. For one, he had a huge, stretched-out mouth with horribly stained teeth. He could reportedly fit 12 eggs in his cheeks at once, much like a chipmunk keeping its chipmunk eggs warm. Additionally, when Tarare was full, he'd get a crazy Octomom gut going, and any other time, he'd have a huge flap of stretched out skin hanging around his waist. He also stank to high hell, even by 18th century French okay, peasant yeah. standards. He was described as reeking, quote, to such a degree that he could not be endured within the distance of 20 paces. So between all this and his horrendous outhouse flooding dumps, his family had had enough. All right, you're eating us out of house and home here. You gotta go, man. You heard me. Kick bricks, froggy. Wow, he just called a French person a frog. That's so racist. No, it's not. They're all French. The guy just looks like a frog is all. Wow. Oh. Well, too late. I'm already offended. That's fair. Dislike. After leaving home, Tarare was forced to beg and steal just to satisfy his gargantuan appetite. Inevitably, people began to take notice of him, and eventually, he landed a job as a street performer in Paris. People would hand Tarare entire baskets of apples, eggs, and even wine corks, and watch in delight as he horked them down without the slightest hesitation. Normally, this went off without a hitch, except for one time when he suffered a severe intestinal blockage. Fortunately, the crowd was kind enough to carry him to the hospital, where he was treated with the strongest laxatives the 18th century had to offer. I would draw what happened next, but it would probably be okay, gamers. My, my mom was giving me so let's some extra time. For a few Even though she yelled at me. Let's go. <laughs> Moving on. Also, I don't even know if my mute button works. This so I'm just like, uh, I'm plugging my mic. Coalition. Ever heard of it? Me neither. Who was in it? Fucking everyone. Anyway, Terrari decided to enlist in the war. After all, maybe that profound emptiness he was feeling was just a lack of purpose in life. Turns out, no, he really was just psychotically hungry. Even after being granted quadruple rations, Terrari would still be digging Good IRL RNG, yeah, I know, bro. After suffering extreme exhaustion, he was sent off to the military hospital in Soutarin. The staff there was so dumbfounded by the man's abilities that they decided to keep him there to run a few experiments. The first of which involved putting Terrari in a room with a meal prepared for 15 people. Naturally, he ate the entire thing and immediately fell asleep. Next, they presented him with a raw eel. In response, Terrari crushed the Thanks. Skull between his teeth before slurping down the entire creature in one go. Now, this is hair clenchingly horrifying for a couple of reasons. Firstly, he put a whole frickin' eel in his stomach, but secondly, there had to be some point during digestion where the meat was gone but the bones still remained. Now, for those of you who don't know, an eel skeleton looks like this. That means Terari had all of those needle-sized ribs stabbing into the walls of his stomach at once, and he was fine. He also ripped a live cat apart with his bare hands, drank its blood, and ate everything but its bones, and then later gagged up the fur and skin like an owl, but, you know, that's neither here nor there. After reviewing our data, I've come to the scientific conclusion that, uh, yeah, we got a goddamn demon on our hands. But as we all know, with great devour comes great responsibility. I'm sorry, I Since Terrari um, was still technically enlisted, the military we have like decided to seven utilize seconds of time abilities we for the greater good. Here. Hey, Terrari, it's me, the general. Listen, could you eat this box with a note in it for me? Aww. 
If you do it, we'll give you a wheelbarrow full of bull organs. <laughs> Lo and behold, two days later, he passed the container in mint condition and was given his reward as promised. With this proof of concept, they made him an official spy and sent him into Prussia with a document in his belt. Oh, this is definitely to top. French colonel. Unfortunately, there are a couple Dude, things you're baby, aren't you eighth rank? that are generally I'm probably not going to bop you, but just for a good a, measurement. You speak German, and B, it's pretty hard to maintain a low profile when you're running around like a madman, wolfing down garbage and mutilating small animals. So he ended up being captured by the enemy. Initially, he kept his mouth shut for once, but after a whipping and what a date, on jail, what? Terari gave in. Like after confessing that he Category. In fact, had vital intelligence snaking its way through his GI tract. The Prussians chained him to a latrine yeah. until the box emerged 30 hours later. The note wasn't actually anything important, so they just mock executed him, gave him a severe beating, and sent him on his way. After all that, oh, then who's eighth? Because I know there's like a 39 one for his X, condition, but, but nothing they ever tried worked. Meanwhile, the man's endless hunger continued to get him into all sorts of trouble. He'd often sneak out of the hospital to eat the scraps behind the local butcher and fight stray dogs in the alley for their precious garbage. He'd also I know it's free, but I'm just wanting to know who's eighth for reference, because I'm definitely not gonna bop eighth since there's such a big gap. But. By this point in my research, I was so desensitized to this guy that I didn't even bat an eye when I first read that. I was just like, all right. I guess he must have been hungry. Anyway, the hospital staff begrudgingly tolerated Terare's buffoonery until one day when he went too far. Well, Terare, you've only had three mess hall raids, four miscellaneous trash related mishaps, and one cadaver defiled. So I'd say, so far, this week's been pretty good. Uh, Doctor, we should probably inform gonna you that a heart. month old child has gone missing from their room. Terare, look at me. Did you eat a fucking baby? <laughs> oh my god. He was promptly kicked out of the hospital and spent four years out and about doing, you know, whatever horrific shit you can imagine. When he came back, he was suffering from advanced tuberculosis and died shortly after arrival. During his autopsy, the surgeons found that when they looked into his mouth, they could see all the way down his throat and into his stomach cavity. As you can imagine, his whole abdominal region was profoundly deformed. Basically, if this is a normal human, this is what they found inside Terare. Just like the man's mind, we can see that around 90% is devoted towards food and 10% towards everything else. So, moral of the story here is that... No, you know what? Not even I can find anything resembling a moral here. Not all stories have a point to them. Sometimes they're just sad and disgusting from beginning to end. And now a word from our sponsor. As you can probably tell, I'm a very visual... Hi, you're on a rock, floating in space. Pretty cool, huh? Some of it's water. Fuck it. Actually, most of it's water. I can't even do so annoying without buying a boat. It's sad. I'm sad. I miss you. A long time this is an amazing ago, video. And also now, nothing is nowhere. When? Never. Makes sense, right? Like I said, it didn't happen. Nothing was never anywhere. That's why it's been everywhere. It's been so everywhere, you don't need a where. You don't even need a when. That's how every it gets. Pega? Forget this. I want to be Wait, can we Go pause, somewhere. please, for Slapsy? Thank you. Things to change. I want to invent time and space. I know it's possible because everything is here, and it probably already happened. I just don't know when to start. And that's a two. Whatever. Oh well. Still top nine, but goddamn it. Exactly Time pieces. Oh, paused it. I think there's a universe now. What's it made of? Quartz and stuff. Ah, that's a thing. In a place. Don't like it? Try a new place. At a different time. Try to stick together because the world is going to get bigger and emptier. It's not empty yet. It's still very full. Not a chance to freeze. Great news. The quarks are now happily married in groups of three. Called a proton and a neutron. There's something else flying around here that wants to join in but can't because it's still too cold. Great news, the protons and neutrons are now happily married to each other. Some of them even doubled up. Great news, the electrons have now joined in. Congratulations, the world is now a bunch of gas in space. But it's getting closer together. And it's getting closer together. Yes. And it's getting closer together. It's a star. New shit just got made. Some stars burn out and die. Bigger stars burn out and die with passion and make some brand new, way crazier shit. Which allows new and more interesting stars to be made and then die and explode into you. So now stars have cool stuff around them, like rocks, ice, and funny clouds, which can make some very interesting things. Like this ball of flaming rocks, for example. Holy shit, we just got hit with another ball of flaming rocks. And it got a mess, which is 
Ah, uh, nice. Weather update: Those rocks might have had water inside them, and now there's hot steam in the sky. Weather update: Cooler temperatures today, and the floor is no longer lava. Weather update: It's raining. Severe flooding alert: The entire world is now an ocean. Foggy. Volcano alert. That's there's nothing in there. What? Something's in the ocean. Okay. Oh, that was the double. Oops, no, I thought that was shockwaves. It lives at the bottom of the ocean and it's kind of a flush emoji. It's being served hot and fresh, made from gnarly space ingredients left over from one of the rocks. Oh, yeah, you can do that. It has secret instructions written inside itself, telling it how to build another one of itself. So that's pretty nifty, I would say. Tired of living at the bottom of the ocean? Now you can eat sunlight. Using a revolutionary technique, you can convert sunlight into food. Side effect, now there's oxygen everywhere and the sky's blue. Then the earth might have been a snowball for a while, maybe even a couple of times. It's a sponge. It's a plant. It's a worm and some other types of weird, strange water bugs and strange fish. It's the <sighs> Wait, why am I still mashing? Wow, that's animals and stuff. We're still in the ocean. Hey, can we go on that? No, no. Why? Some is a deadly laser. Okay. Now the animals can go on land. Come on, animals, let's go on land. Oh, okay. And there's no food in so I don't care. Where are you going? It's up here. Is that two X? Baby in the egg. In the water. Trap? In the egg. Works for me. And now everything's huge, including yeah. bugs. Want to see a map of the land? Sure. Oh fuck! Now everything's dead. Just get in near the survivors. Hey. Keep your eye on this one because it's about to become the dinosaurs. Here's another map of the land. Yeah, it broke apart. Don't worry about it. Doesn't. We did the thing. We did the baby. Yeah. No, 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 I'm gonna have to. Actually, learn that strategy. Here come the mammals. God. Look at those breasts. Now Damn they're it. gonna dominate the world, and one of them. Two X, A. Wow, we did it. No, awesome. Like, walk like that, and grab stuff at the same time, and bang rocks together to make winded rocks. Ouch! Hey, it's on wow. fire. Ouch! And make crazy sounds with their voice, <laughs> which can mean different things. <laughs> I guess I'll have to do this for the SJ did. Almost. Oh, no. What? You can walk. That's over sick. There. Cool. That's gaming. Well, I guess we're stuck here now. Let's review. There's people in the Uh, screen chance. Let food. me see. Bucket, Please, thank you. Grass. Look at this. I control the food now. Now everyone will want to be my friend and live near me. Let's all build houses, except mine is bigger because I own the food. This is great. I wonder if anyone else is doing this. We still this. lost time in finale, which is like a brother moment, but um. 